David Gill and I were working on a series called Hollywood and we were working on the script and we were dealing with comedy and we had no idea how to do it because Chaplin footage which was going to be most of the comedy episode was not available. The man who owned the rights to the Chaplin footage so that he didn't have to be bothered with anybody said a hundred thousand pounds a minute. So we didn't know what to do but we knew we had to have an awful lot of really good Chaplin material to do justice to the man who after all was the most famous figure from this whole period. Chaplin was still alive. We wrote letters to him, got no answer and his biographer David Robinson suggested that we wrote to Rachel Ford, his business manager. She was the daughter of a First World War general and she was extremely intimidating and she said um, if you'd like to come down to the vault uh, I'll show you a little snippet that Sir Charles has allowed you to have. I thought a snippet? How are we going to do a program on comedy from, with a snippet? However, never mind, we sh broke the speed records getting down to the vault which was at Denham Laboratories and we were met by this extremely impressive but intimidating lady who took us in and showed us this vault which was rather disappointing because I'd expected it to be full of rusty cans but it was full of silver cans with the pieces of paper still hanging out of it saying City Lights, Great Dictator, all the famous titles and I'd hoped for some titles I'd never heard of but while I was looking around these cans down the bottom I saw something called How to Make Movies so I said to her uh, what's that? And she said oh that's a little film he made for fun it's not very good. I said, what? You mean he made films for fun that were never released? She said yes. I said could we see it? I don't see why not. So she took that and some of the other cans that looked promising and they were taken by a, a, a lab technician down to the theatre and we sat in that theatre and we saw the first roll of City Lights which was originally going to introduce City Lights which was a sequence of Chaplin with a stick caught in a grill and he makes seven minutes of inspired comedy out of the smallest prop in the world, just a piece of wood that's got caught in a grill and he tries to shift it with his cane and it builds and it builds and it builds and how anybody could have cut that out of the film is beyond me but he did, he had that self-discipline. And then we saw other sequences which were remarkable. We saw visits to the studio, absolutely dazzling. And of course, Rachel Ford at the end of that said, well, you can't have any of that. <laughs> so, well, we got our snippet for the program. We got a little bit more than a snippet, thank God. And we were managed to make that program for, for that series, but we couldn't use any of this material. And we knew whatever we did, we had to make our next project one on the unknown chaplain. So fade out, fade in, there's a collector, a pirate collector called Raymond Rohar and Raymond Rohar used to meet David Gill every month for dinner. He was an extremely charmless individual and he wouldn't have anything to do with me because I was a film collector. Um, David was clean, he wasn't a film collector so he used to meet him and get fascinating information out of him. So naturally he told him about this discovery of the Chaplin footage and Raymond Roja said, how many cans? And he says, huh? what do you mean? He says, well how many cans are these outtakes? Oh, 30, 40? I've got more than that. And David said, you've got more than that of what? And Roja said, I've got more than that of mutual outtakes. So it took 18 months of negotiation to get hold of this footage and I wasn't allowed to be there at the amazing moment when the huge Pantechnican arrived. It had all been in France and it was picked up from various uh, depots in France and brought to Dover Customs and the Customs took one look at it and said <laughs> couldn't bear going through. There were three, 300,000 feet of Charlie Chaplin and 400,000 feet of Sydney Chaplin I think, something like that and the cans were all rusty and the material was delivered to a laboratory in Perivale 
and the crew that were going to work on this, the editing crew, assembled there with a steam deck, like the one behind me. And we laced up the first roll. Everything was in negative form. It was the camera negative, the actual footage that had gone through Chaplin's camera, Rolly Totherow's camera. The first piece of film was a test for the city lights, the leading role in city lights. But it wasn't Virginia Cheryl who eventually played the part. It was the girl in the gold rush, Georgia Hale. She plays it, and that was dynamic. But after that came, was only from the mutual period, 1916, 1917, which many people think is his greatest period. He turned out uh, 12 masterpieces, two reelers. But we couldn't really make it out for a long time because it was in negative, and you have to adjust your mind Trying to recognize people in negative form was terribly difficult, and trying to decide what we should transfer was terribly difficult. So we went through all this footage, and at the end of it, we were no better off than we were at the beginning. We just didn't know what to do with it. And we went back to the cutting rooms, and we got on with other things. But David had a brilliant idea, and one evening he just sat down with the editor and put the shots in numerical order. And while he was doing that, he suddenly realized that Chaplin was making it up as he went along. And he had no idea what he was doing any more than we had. And he was making notes and then changing it and doing something else and changing it and trying out something else. And he thought on film instead of paper. So it was a godsend. It was the notebooks of a great artist. And you could see him in starting in one direction, which was completely wrong, and having to turn around, recast, and make almost a totally different film. I was brought up watching Chaplin's. I assumed that they were made like any other film. Very economically, somebody sat down, wrote a script, it was cast, and the sets were built according to that script, and they went ahead and created the comedy, and that was the end of that. Um, then I read that Chaplin used as much footage on The Immigrant, which is a two-reeler, as Griffith had used on Intolerance, which is over three hours. So I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. And it was only when we were looking at the footage of The Immigrant and we began to realize how Chaplin worked that it, it really was a revelation that he hadn't a clue and he never refers to his working methods in his autobiography, I suppose, because he must have been slightly ashamed of them. One is supposed to know what one is doing when one is a filmmaker. It is the most humiliating comment that you can hear on the set. Uh, he doesn't know what he's doing. And the fact is, that was the source of his genius, that he didn't, and he was going to go on and on and on until presumably a lamp went on in his head which said, that's right. How else could he have produced so much footage and then selected exactly the right take or certainly the best take and then he cut it himself, he edited it himself, which is something else I didn't realize. And his editing is remarkably good. It may not be perfect in the sense of continuity, but it's always rhythmically correct and it always feels right. And his direction too was absolutely right for the scene. What we noticed was he never ever altered the camera setup. Once he'd got it fixed, he did hundreds of takes, but he never then did what directors like George Stevens or William Wyler did later, try an angle there, try an angle there, try an angle there. The insecurity of the film director wasn't there at all. He was totally secure. He knew exactly what he was doing in that sense. Uh, it was just he was working on getting the best performance and the funniest uh, portrayal before he passed on to the next scene. And that was, that was a revelation indeed. Well, that was pretty exciting, and while we were working on that, David Shepard, who is a film historian and archivist, told me there was another collection of Chaplin footage. This one, again, took 18 months of negotiation. 
and it's just as well Thames gave us a lot of time to make this program because we had one episode entirely devoted to City Lights and we managed to get an interview with Virginia Cheryl which was very difficult to get hold of but she gave us this dazzling interview but what we lacked was any footage of the picture being made we had plenty of the film itself and stills and her talking but it was anyway when this when this collector delivered the film and we ran it we discovered it was as though we had sent a crew out through the decades back to the set of the city lights and asked them to get exactly what we wanted a friend of Chaplin's called Ralph Barton an illustrator and caricaturist and art director had been so privileged he was able to stand beside the camera with a 16 millimeter home movie camera and just film whatever he wanted and this was what we were presented with and it made the program at the very end of assembling Unknown Chaplin we showed it to the head of publicity at the television company that made it and David came back one night and met him in the foyer and he'd been drinking and he said hello I've just seen your program and I think it's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life and he lurched off up the stairs and David was very shaken by this and so was I I couldn't understand whenever we showed it to anybody that actually nobody laughed there was a dead silence at the end of the program and I, I thought something was seriously wrong we took the same material um, things like the stick in the grill things like some of the studio visits we took to a um, film festival in Colorado the Telluride Film Festival in Colorado and the audience was on the floor with laughter the Chaplin footage works a hundred percent on the screen because he designs it for 25 foot picture and not a 25 inch picture I believe that and it's an odd thing for me to be saying this on a DVD but Chaplin doesn't work on television to anywhere near the same extent as he works in the cinema in the cinema it's surefire we were incredibly lucky incredibly privileged and it's marvelous that unknown Chaplin is being made available for a new generation